So welcome everybody and thank you all so much for coming tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce author and reporter Ted Bridenstine and his new book, Before Brooklyn, The Unsung Heroes Who Helped Break Baseball's Color Barrier. This book tells the story of the little-known heroes who fought segregation in baseball and how the city of Boston and the Red Sox played a part in the crucial integration. Ted Bridenstine has been a reporter for Chronicle, WCVB TV Boston's award-winning and America's longest-running locally produced nightly news magazine since 1997. Tonight's program is sponsored by the Friends of the Thomas Green Public Library, so thank you as always to the Friends. Without further ado, here is Ted Reinstein. Thank you very much, Alexa. Thank you very much. And thank you all for, uh, for coming out tonight. Um, how many of you have been at one of my previous talks here at the Crane. Not so many. Um, we had a great time. Uh, no, this is actually, I think it's three or four years uh, since I've been here. So I appreciate you all coming out tonight. Uh, as Alexis said, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, my most recent book, which is uh, all about really what was the first significant civil rights victory of the 20th century. Uh, breaking baseball's color barrier, so it's entirely fitting to be talking about it during Black History Month. And I actually like to start, uh, believe it or not, with a question, because um, I'm sure many of you uh, share a love of history like I do. And something that I have always found interesting about history, how we learn it or don't learn it, um, is that I think very often we may think that we understand a certain either a moment in history, a great invention, an achievement, uh, what have you, right? And as time goes on, and by time, I mean it can be decades, it can be centuries, but as we get further and further away from that history, from that event, right, we often don't necessarily really understand the context of it. We might know a date, we might know a name involved, but even an event that isn't so far back, like breaking baseball's color barrier, right, which is not so long ago, um, there's things about it that a majority of people don't fully understand. Uh, I'm going to prove it to you. So I'm going to prove it right now, okay, how that this can happen, right? So, question. After uh, Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier, that's not Jackie Robinson. So what you're going to do now is you're seeing the talk backward uh, in 11 seconds. Okay. So after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, anybody hazard a guess as to who was the second black major league ball player? Any real baseball fans here? Any guesses? Sometimes I get guesses like Larry Doby or Satchel Page. Satchel Page is a good guess because right in the ballpark, as it were, in terms of the time. But they're all wrong. Never had the correct guess because it's a bit of a trick question. So why would someone know the answer to a trick question necessarily, right? Because after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, the second black major league ball player was Jackie Robinson. Because, and this sounds like blasphemy during Black History Month, Jackie Robinson did not do the thing you think he did. Jackie Robinson did not integrate Major League Baseball. Jackie Robinson reintegrated Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball had been integrated more than 60 plus years before Jackie Robinson by someone you likely have never even heard of, this guy, Moses Fleetwood Walker. So already then, uh, I think we've proven the point that there's something rather fundamental about that huge moment in American history that we don't fully understand. We think he did something he didn't do. And the person who actually did the thing we think he did we don't even know his name, right? So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us, like I said, we don't fully understand some of the details of breaking baseball's color barrier, but it also tells us something about early Major League Baseball, which is that unlike every other major American institution of the time, Major League Baseball, as it really began to develop 
in the two decades or so right after the Civil War was an outlier. It was an outlier because it was integrated. There was no other major American institution of its size, of its significance, that was integrated right after the Civil War. How many black you know, Supreme Court justices do you think there were sitting on the bench in the 1870s? None. So baseball looked a little bit more like America than other major American institutions of the time. It had players like Bud Fowler, one of the most impassioned, one of the most exciting, one of the most fascinating, really, early black ball players. And we're going to learn more about Bud Fowler and what was essentially heartbreaking about his story. But people like Bud Fowler, people like Frank Grant, the first black professional ball player from Massachusetts, which is why I include him here. Frank Grant from the Berkshires, right? And most famous of all, the Walker brothers. Moses Fleetwood right here, his younger brother Weldy right here. And in 1881, they were teammates briefly on the Oberlin Ohio College baseball team. And Moses Fleetwood Walker was, as much as we overuse this word, a transformational figure. He really was, in more ways than one. He transformed baseball and not in just the way you're thinking. He transformed baseball in terms of transforming an entire position of baseball. So this is the period of time when the term backstop is coined, okay? Today, right, we think of the term backstop, we think of like a physical structure, right, that, uh, you know, the, the, whether it's concrete or wood, netting, to keep a batted ball from hitting people in the, in the face, you know, watching a ball game. Not then. There were no structures very often. Baseball is often at this time, this is only a decade or so after the Civil War, baseball is played, especially in the American South, often on fields that have been cleared of rubble that is still standing on the side of the field, right? So there's no, there's no, there's no you know, luxury suites, there's no, there's no stands, and there's no backstop. What there is, is a catcher. The catcher is called the backstop then, right? So the catcher would be the least skilled position on the field at that time. That was where the player who sucked the most, the worst player on the team, would be your catcher. Not today. Today, catcher is the most skilled position on the field, right? But not then. He changed all that. Moses Fleetwood Walker was, first and foremost, an extraordinary athlete. He was what we would call today in baseball, they call a five-tool player, meaning he played all five facets of the game. He could run, he could hit, he could hit with power, he could field his position, and he had a great arm. So all five parts of the game of baseball, he played with great skill. Such skill, he was irresistible to a major league team. Now, <laughs> major league teams in the 1880s were not scouting and not recruiting black ball players, okay? There was great cost to doing that with their fans, and yet they did. So this is how good he was, that the Toledo Blue Stockings, which at the time were a, were a National League Major League team, they had to sign this guy because he was just too good to resist. So they did. So he transformed the position of catcher, and by being signed to a Major League team, he was a transformational figure in terms of the culture of America. This is a young black man. Look at the date. This is a young black man born at a time when slavery still existed, born to parents who were born themselves into slavery, and he is now set to become the first black major league ball player. So this was like the feel-good story of 1884, and that's how it was reported by all the major news outlets. I guarantee Chronicle would have been there covering this moment, this game, right? Not everybody felt that way. And unfortunately, one of the people who did not feel really good about this, did not feel this was a feel-good story, uh, but something actually that they really, really didn't like, happened to be somebody who had an outsized influence at the time in Major League Baseball, Cap Anson. So Cap Anson, to give the man his due, was the first bona fide superstar of Major League Baseball. If you've never heard of him, Cap Anson in the early pioneering days of baseball was, you name the player who would later become a superstar. Willie Mays, Mickey Mantle, Ted Williams, Joe DiMaggio, this was Cap Anson. 
still holds to this day two or three batting records for the Chicago Cubs, which is extraordinary because this is what they call, you've probably heard the term, the dead ball era, right? The balls were more mushy. They didn't have a cork center with a little super ball in the middle, right? The let's pay players hit, you know, 45, 50 home runs a year. That wasn't happening, but he was hitting 16 to 18 home runs a year, which would be the equivalent today of 50 home runs a year. Still holds those records, so that's kind of amazing. Um, also part of the record, but not on his plaque in Cooperstown, he was an unrepentant racist. He was a bully. And apparently, from reports from the time, he had what was called, quote, an uncommonly foul mouth. I've never seen any, and I've looked, and I've you know, read with great interest to see if some, some, some examples would be offered of what for the time would be an uncommonly foul mouth. And I, you know, I grew up with brothers that played sports, but so I'm curious if there was something, some word he knew that I never heard, but I've never come across it. Um, he did not like this development. Um, he was the captain, the slugging first baseman of the marquee teams. Cubs were also the, the marquee team of early baseball, right? I mean, their years and years and decades of futility would come later. In early baseball, they were the Yankees. They were the dynastic champions. And this guy, this guy was the player playing for the team that people took trains and traveled all night to see the Cubs play and to see their dashing captain hit a home run. Didn't like the fact that the Cubs are starting out the 1884 season against the team that fielded a black ball player. And I use air quotes because Cap Anson never used any word except one that we would never utter. So this is the development now. Doesn't like it, doesn't like it so much, plays the game under protest, Following the game, files an official grievance with the owners of Major League Baseball. The Cubs will no longer take the field against any team that fields a black ball player. So you can imagine that the owners of Major League Baseball got to take a threat like this pretty seriously. This is the marquee player on the marquee team, and he's threatening he's not going to play any more games against teams that field a black ball player. So the owners do what owners often do, which is try to avoid coming to a decision in a confrontational situation and kick the can down the road a little bit. They managed to do that for two seasons, but by 1887, Anson has made it very clear the Cubs are not taking the field for the very next game, and the owners have to meet. They do in Buffalo, New York in July 1887, and they accede to Cap Anson's threats. And they vote in a vote that is as significant as it was cowardly, really, from a standpoint of transparency, right? Because if you are going to take a vote, if you were to take a vote on something of this level today in baseball, uh, this would be something that obviously would be covered by all news outlets. There would be owners who would be forced to come and, and before reporters and explain and defend why a decision like this was made, not then. There is no transcript, no transcript, unless you know one is hiding in somebody's draw somewhere rolled up in an old map, but there is no transcript of what transpired at the meeting. There is no transcript of how the vote went down. All we know, and we don't even know who voted how, all we know is that the then owners of Major League Baseball voted by a majority that going forward, no black ball players would be offered a major or minor league contract. Those who were playing under existing contracts like Walker would be allowed to play them out and there would be no more. The color barrier was now a reality. So I mentioned that Bud Fowler was this really exciting, impassioned early black ball player, and he was. And I also mentioned that there was an element of heartbreak to his story, and there is, because Cap Anson, uh, Cap Anson, Bud Fowler was somebody who lived to play baseball. And I don't mean that figuratively either. I mean that literally. He literally would have played baseball 365 days a year. He almost did as it was. And he did that. Obviously, he couldn't be playing baseball up in Quincy at this time of year, but he didn't have to. He'd be playing up in places like Quincy during the summertime. And as the weather cooled and turned to fall, He'd be making his way down south by fall up here. He'd probably be playing in Florida. By fall and winter up here, he'd be playing in South America. And then he would start working his way north once again. But with the advent of the color barrier, he was no longer going to be able to do the single thing that seemed to give his life purpose 
and meaning. He died of a blood disorder in Frankfurt, New York in 1913. He was only 55. His unmarked grave told not a word of a truly extraordinary life. For years since the color barrier began to spread, Bud Fowler had relentlessly fought for a place in organized baseball. Along with all the other early black ball players, he had continued to try and play in the shadow of the descending barrier as teams shed black ball players and refused to sign more. Fowler had uncommon talent, there's no question. Make no mistake, he was an incredibly talented ball player. He's in the Hall of Fame. In fact, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame not this past summer, so it will be two years ago this uh, coming summer, and he was inducted in the same class as, uh, as Big Poppy David Ortiz. So he had talent, but often it seemed to those who were watching him, this was a guy who literally traveled the Western Hemisphere, right, to play baseball. So it seemed to people that his greatest talent was not only being a good ball player, but into somehow seeming to outrun what everybody could see was the inescapable end. For Bud Fowler, the end came in Lansing, Michigan in 1895. He was finally and completely out of options. They all were, by the way. But Bud Fowler is significant because Bud Fowler was literally the last black ball player standing. My skin is against me, Fowler wrote in 1895. If I hadn't been born quite so black, I might as caught on as a Spaniard or something of that kind. Who knows? My black skin is so black, it just bars me. I'm done. Now, as the 20th century unfolded, they were all done. The color barrier was complete. It would take another 50 years of fierce Fowler-like will and determination to break through again. So now we're up to 1890, right? Color barrier falls in 1887. Now we're up into the 1890s. And in 1890s, I always say this is the decade that Jim Crow moves in on steroids. Because, although what, what we call Jim Crow, right? Segregation, especially in the American South, it had existed since the 1830s, 1840s, and before even. But now, now, it completely changes. It completely changes because now it happens by sanction of the state because this is the period of what has often been called the single worst American Supreme Court decision in history. There are others to choose from, but this one is particularly egregious because this one is ratified by the state. This is segregation ratified by the state. It starts out as a, as a, as a transportation issue in New Orleans. It goes over next door uh, to Alabama, and it is all about um, whether or not the state will allow uh, blacks to ride on uh, trains that do not have a dedicated, as the law they wanted to put, put it, colored passenger car. And it goes to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court finds for the southern states. This is the separate but equal dictum. And now it didn't matter, right? We said that baseball was an outlier. It had been. It had been. I mean, baseball now turns in what had been its status as being the only major American institution of its time that was, that was integrated. It trades that in for really what became, would become baseball's original sin, uh, the color barrier. So now it didn't matter whether you were playing baseball. It didn't matter whether you were looking for a job or looking for a place to live. It didn't matter whether you were, it, which side of the room you'd line up on to get a drink of water at a public water fountain. Segregation is now complete and everywhere. So we're going to now cover the next 45 years, uh, but we're not going to go year by year because I'd like to have us out by breakfast. So um, we're going to zip through. Um, but the point is, this is another misconception, this period. Actually, this period now to 1920, and especially from 20 to 45, Another misconception, right? So there's that misconception about Jackie Robinson integrating baseball when he didn't. He reintegrated baseball. But I think there's also a misconception that goes hand in hand with that, I've always found, which is that until Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier, blacks somehow weren't a face of professional baseball. And nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, this is in some ways a golden age of black baseball, which sounds bitterly ironic to say that because, of course, they were barred from playing at the highest level of baseball in America, the major leagues, but they were not barred from playing baseball professionally, and they did. This is what's called 
the barnstorming era, right? I'm sure you've heard of that phrase. This is, I mean, there have been books written about it, movies made about it, like movies like uh, Bingo Long's Traveling All Stars, which romanticized it a little bit. There wasn't a whole lot romantic about being on the road constantly, trying to play three, four, five, half a dozen ball games in the course of a weekend, traveling three, four, five hundred miles in a weekend to play half a dozen ball games in a week. That, that is tiring stuff. Playing on rickety old buses, traveling on them, uncomfortable. You pull into towns where you can't get a bite to eat, you can't get a room to stay over. So not a whole lot romantic. However, there was an exceptional level of baseball being played by some of these barnstorming teams. There were dozens of them, but there were really about a dozen, 10 or 12, really extraordinary black barnstorming teams. And by extraordinary, I mean these were some of the best baseball teams in the world, uh, including the major leagues. In fact, many of them would play major league teams and, uh, and beat them, and beat them. Uh, this is an era when players were not making you know, $325 million a year. Uh, they were, these were times when players routinely, every major league player worked a, a job over the winter time. And so when they had an off day, if they had a, uh, a, a day off in the schedule, if they arrived to, let's say, Cleveland or Baltimore or Detroit, you know, with a day to spare before they started a three-game series, they would pick up an exhibition game. They would play every day they possibly could. And these black barnstorming teams were the perfect team to hook up with because there was always a team somehow roving near enough to hook up with a major league team. And they would play. The level of competition for a major league team was great. One of my favorite examples of one of these major league black barnstorming team uh, contests was a three game series. I think, I think I have the date right, in 1903. It was the Cincinnati Redlegs as they were then known and they picked up a three-game exhibition series, three games, over the course of a weekend against a black barnstorming team, the Chicago Black Giants. And um, the Chicago Black Giants beat the Cincinnati Redlegs. They swept all three games. On Monday morning, the then owner and president of the Cincinnati Redlegs sent out a memo to the team. They are no longer allowed to play any black barnstorming teams. This guy, Rube Foster, won two of those games. Won two of those games. Um, pitched and won two of those games. Both complete games. In fact, one of those complete games was 12 innings. You will never see Chris Sale do that. Okay? <laughs> you will never see Chris Sale do that. But Rube Foster was really the first great black pitcher. And it, it, apparently just a fearsome presence. He stood about... 6'3", six, 6'4", six, weighed anywhere on any given day, 245, 255 pounds. He was like a left tackle on the pitcher's mound. Uh, Texas kid threw a blazing fastball. And it was said, in fact, in that Cincinnati series, at least a couple of players on the Cincinnati team came up with phantom injuries because it was said to be terrifying to stand in against this guy. Right? Part of the reason was, apparently, he very often uh, didn't know where the ball was going. So that's, that's a good reason to be worried about that. But he was the really first great black pitcher. And he understood something that no one else who had played in these barnstorming teams did. Other people understood the desire to get back to the major leagues, right, for black ball players. He understood how to do it. There had been a couple of other attempts, both of them unsuccessful, in, in putting together an organized league instead of just these, these random barnstorming teams. But he understood something in a bigger picture. And it, it proved to be prophetic. It turned out to be exactly what needed to happen. And he made it happen. Um, he is considered, rightly, the father of black baseball because Rube Foster created the single most vital unsung hero in making the color barrier fall. He is the creator of the Negro Leagues. And without the Negro Leagues, you know, people sometimes ask me, you know, do I think without the Negro League, if the Negro Leagues had never happened, would that have affected the color barrier? Absolutely. Absolutely. My own sense is that without the Negro Leagues, the color barrier would have fallen eventually, but not until, my guess is maybe until the late 1960s, early 70s, as part of broader civil rights progress. No way, no way in the late 1940s. But Rube Foster understood something. He understood that 
there has to be a showcase for the greatest talent in black baseball in America. There has to be a showcase. He understood that these barnstorming teams, this is great. Yes, people are able to cobble together a living playing baseball this way, but no one knows who the hell we are. And by they, he didn't mean blacks because blacks knew who these players were. Blacks came out and supported their games. Black America understood who Rube Foster was. White America did not. And he understood, never mind me, he understood that until white America is able to look at these teams, know who they are, maybe see a game, that, it's not blacks, he understood, it's white America that has barred us from playing Major League Baseball. We have to create the showcase that will be indisputably the highest level of play for a black ball player. And he did it. And he did it. In fact, we're coming right up on the, uh, the, the anniversary of the uh, founding of the Negro Leagues in Kansas City. There is Rube Foster right here. Here's the proud papa of the Negro Leagues on its founding year. That's the founding class of the Negro Leagues. I want to draw your attention to this guy right here. This guy right here, his name is Jail Wilkinson. He is the owner of one of the two or three most iconic Negro League teams, the Kansas City Monarchs, for whom Satchel Paige would play. And Jail Wilkinson is the only white owner in the entire history of the Negro Leagues. And now, I don't point that out to, you know, point him out as some sort of racial peculiarity. I point it out because, after all, we're talking about Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier. And, spoiler alert, he's going to do that. And we'll make a triumphant appearance before we're done. But there is a straight shot, straight shot, from this day in 1920, 25 years out, to Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier. Because J.L. Wilkinson will be the Negro League owner who will sign Jackie Robinson to his first professional baseball contract in 1945, and then it will just be six months until the color barrier falls. So the Negro Leagues are born and the Negro Leagues take off. Think of it like, in terms of all those barnstorming teams, right? Think of it like there had been this, this crimped fire hose of black talent, baseball talent in America, because there were only so many teams for these good players to hook up on, right? Only a couple of dozen teams. But now, with the advent of the Negro Leagues, now there are many, many more teams for players to hook up with. And so now some of that talent is, is, is coming gushing out. People like John Pops Lloyd, the first great black home run hitter, Judy Johnson, one of the most exciting black players of that time. A decade or so later, Oscar Charleston, one of the greatest fielding shortstops in baseball history. And my personal favorite, James Cool Papa Bell, mostly because I think he just gets the best nickname in baseball history. <laughs> cool Papa Bell, are unarguably today considered by all baseball uh, experts to be the fastest person to have ever played Major League Baseball. So all this ta talent, excuse me, is playing now. And the Negro League goes from 14 founding teams to 18 to 23 to 32 to 34. They're able to separate into a Negro National League, a Negro American League. They're able to have the first of two Negro League World Series. And it looks like the sky will be the limit for the growth of the Negro Leagues. And it might have been. It might have been if the sky instead hadn't fallen in. Because the first decade of the Negro League's explosive growth, the 1920s, ends with what? The crash. The crash. You know, talk about how we look back at history. It's not that we don't, I think we all understand that the Great Depression, just those two words alone, you grow up with them and thinking like, oh my God, you know, it's, it was this cataclysm. And it was, but I think as time goes on, I think we sometimes forget just what a cataclysm it really was. I'm sure all of us grew up with you know, parents, grandparents, and relatives who, who grew up during the Great Depression. My late dad was 10 or 11 years old in the first worst years of the Depression, 1930, 31, 32. We forget, I mean, we've had American unemployment in just the last decade functionally under 1%, at least twice. It's barely 3% and just under now, 25%. 25% unemployment. And in minority communities, flip that. Only a quarter working in many minority communities. More than 30,000 American businesses. Imagine, 30,000 American businesses going under every year during the first worst, worst years of the Great Depression, including the Negro Leagues, gone. Now, mind you, every one of that first class of those Negro League teams in 1920, every single one of those team owners 
was in and of himself, and they were all men, but in and of himself was a successful business person, every one of them. But their being successful business people was like comparing apples and oranges when it came to the owners of the then 16 Major League Baseball teams. Um, there was no comparison. Even these owners, even the Negro League owners who in themselves had founded successful businesses, they still were, a, were they had to get money from black-owned banks to help finance these teams. Black-owned banks, gone in the wake of the Great Depression. So the Negro League, with one exception, as we'll see, is gone. Now, you might wonder how many Major League teams went under during the Great Depression. I mean, all 16 of the then Major League teams, each one was a thriving American business, more than 30,000 of which are going under during the Great Depression. So you might wonder how many Major League teams went under during the Great Depression. Not so many. Now, the re and this is, gets to Tom Yawkey. This gets to... Um, the reason I point this out is to give you a sense of what the disparity was between the Negro Leagues and the Major Leagues, right? So, Tom Yawkey. I don't know if you remember what you got on your 16th birthday, but Tom Yawkey came into the first installment of his trust fund at $16.34 million. Five years later, he came into the second part and another $16.34 million, and he bought the Boston Red Sox. So you might, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money today. It was a, even more money then. Tom Yawkey, which is why I put him up here, Tom Yawkey was the pauper of American League Baseball owners, the poorest of the 16 Major League Baseball owners. Now, we mentioned the Cubs. Cubs were owned by a guy named Phil Wrigley. I guarantee everyone in this room has used Mr. Wrigley's product. Sometimes I'd see if I can feel his product. Uh, Cardinals. Cardinals were owned by a guy named Gussie Bush. Gussie Bush was brewing a little beer out in St. Louis on the East Coast, the Yankees. Yankees were owned by a guy named Colonel Jake Rupert. He was brewing Knickerbocker beer. Fabulously more wealthy than poor pauper Tom Yawkey. Now, I mentioned that the Negro League, so they were insulated. The Major League teams were insulated from the worst effects of the Great Depression. Now, I mentioned that there was one exception to the Negro League going under, and we are back to our friend, J.L. Wilkinson of the Kansas City Monarchs, who was a fascinating figure. Google him sometime. He was really a, a fascinatingly progressive figure for the time. He was like way ahead of his time, doing stuff that was like, he signed a woman to play baseball on a man's baseball team in the 1930s. He was a, he was a farm kid from Iowa. There was nothing about his background that would have suggested that he would have been this sort of super progressive figure, but he was. And when the, when the, when the Great Depression hit, he really did not want to lay off his team. And he told them, I will keep you on payroll as long as I possibly can, but you're going to have to play baseball almost every day. And they said, okay, Skip. And he said, okay. And he bought a bus that they named for some reason Wilkie. And uh, they were barnstorming through Canada in 1930s, early 1930s. So this is a wonderfully generous gesture, but they never could have kept doing that indefinitely. And fortunately for them, and especially for history, they didn't have to because in the first worst years of the Great Depression, the single most improbable event in the whole story takes place, which is that the Negro Leagues, which had folded, are reborn. And first of all, it's improbable on so many levels. Nothing's being reborn during the Great Depression. Things are dying left, right, and center everywhere you look. So there, this is something being reborn. And look where they're reborn. Pittsburgh, ground zero of American unemployment. So that's improbable enough, and the two people who were responsible for saving the Negro Leagues hated each other's guts. <coughs> hated each other's guts. Lifelong, mortal enemies. Cumberland Posey Jr. is an interesting figure in his own right. His dad was a pioneering black figure in Pittsburgh, the first black licensed civil engineer in Pennsylvania, and he started a couple of very successful businesses. I'm sure he hoped that his young son, Composer Jr., might follow him into the family business, but he was a sports fanatic. Basketball, like you can see, which was a relatively new sport, and baseball, which he coached and played, and baseball wins out, fortunately. And in the late 1920s, he is approached about saving a legendary black ball club in Pittsburgh, the Homestead Grays, right? So Homestead section of Pittsburgh. 
And if nobody buys the team, the team's going to go, boom, disappear. So he decides he's going to save the team. So he cobbles some money together, puts all his savings in. His dad loans him some money. He raises some money. He gets some money from some banks that still exist. And, uh, and he was able to save the team. Now, he had talent as a ball player. He had talent as a young businessman. All of those had already been in evidence. What was about to become evident was a skill that really couldn't have manifested itself before because he had never managed a baseball team before and been responsible for you know, putting a team together and drawing the best from his players, um, especially young black ball players, uh, in terms of inspiring them uh, against great challenges to, to play well and play successfully. I always say, you know, if we're lucky, all of us, if we're lucky, um, we or our kids or what have you um, have had the opportunity to play for a coach and he or she was that coach that, you know, you knew they wanted to win, right? You knew that they weren't screwing around. They, they wanted to win. But they also seem to want to teach you something, right? You always had that impression. And you knew there was something admirable about that, even if, you know, you didn't quite know what the hell they were trying to do. That's what he was. That's what he was. So I could go on telling stories about the way that he inspired players, but it's easier to just look at the results. Because the results had never been seen before. Because in the first year of Composey Jr., owning, managing, general managing, the Homestead Grays, all they did was go out and have the greatest single season of any baseball team in the history of the world. Let me put 143 wins in context, two ways. Let me put it in context for you from then, that period, and now. So then, baseball didn't play 162 games. The major leagues only played 154. They came within 10 games of being undefeated. That does not happen in baseball. It has never happened. It will never happen. They almost did it. They almost did it. Bring it up to the present day. There are two major league teams, one of whom plays less than 50 minutes from here. Two major league teams who two years ago, two seasons ago now, cumulatively, two teams who play 162 games, two teams together, their wins did not total 143. So he breaks history, makes history. His arch enemy, all he wants to do is outdo him, and he almost does. So completely different story. Wipe that slate clean because his life is a completely different story. And frankly, it's a lot harder life. Gus Greenlee grows up one of seven kids, six brothers in Pittsburgh. Very, very tough. Impoverished, thrown out of school multiple times, drunk for a dad. Very tough. He go, joins the army. He goes off to fight in World War I. He's wounded at the Battle of Verdun. He's decorated, comes back to Pittsburgh. Now you can't even get a drink to drown your sorrows because it's prohibition on top of the Great Depression. So he needs a job. He cobbles some money together. He buys a rickety old car. He's going to drive a cab. Okay. Guy comes up to him and he says, uh, is this your car? He says, yeah, what about it? He says, no, I just wonder if you want to make a little extra money. He says, what do you got? He says, well, I, I represent the Latrobe Brewing Company. If you've ever had a Rolling Rock, apparently you have had a Rolling Rock beer before. <laughs> then they were brewing beer then too, even though it was illegal. But he was wondering if he, this guy wanted to use his cab to drive the bootleg hooch around to all the little speakeasies in Pittsburgh. So he did. Starts making a lot of extra money. Two weeks later, another guy comes up to him, different guy. He says, hey, pal, this your car? He says, what do you got? He said, whoa, whoa. He said, I'm just wondering if I represent all the major bookies in Pittsburgh. And I'm wondering if you want to run the bets around the city for us. We're looking for somebody who has their own car. And, but, so he does. Now he's making hand money hand over fist. He's making so much money, he doesn't know what to do with it. And he realizes that I can make even more money if I cut out the middleman. So he does. Now, I don't mean he, like, cut them out. But he did go into business doing all this by himself. And at one point during the Great Depression, Gus Greenlee was making, wait for it, $12,500 a week. Yeah, whoa. <laughs> That's over $11 million a week adjusted for the economy of the Great Depression. So he literally 
literally doesn't know what to do with his money. He builds a ballpark. He doesn't have a baseball team, but he builds a ballpark. Then he builds a huge jazz club. He doesn't have anybody to play in his jazz club, but he finds them. Another great story to Google is his jazz club. So he built it in the black section of Pittsburgh, which is the Hill District and Crawford Avenue runs right through it. And uh, his club was called the Crawford Grill. And sure enough, it became an incredible jazz mecca. You name the jazz grade of the period, Billy, Ella, Dizzy Gillespie, they all played the Crawford Grill. So now he's making money. He's got a jazz club going. Now, I don't know how much he liked jazz. I don't know how much he liked baseball. You know what he liked? These were great ways to launder all the dirty money that's rolling in. So he's approached his lucky day. He's approached about saving another Pittsburgh baseball team. So he's like, this is my great chance to get back at Composey. So he buys the team, has a ballpark, buys the team, changes the name so he can cross promote his jazz club, right? Smart business guy. And the Pittsburgh Crawfords are born. And one year after his arch enemy wins 143 games, Gus Greenlee's Pittsburgh Crawfords go out and win almost 100 games. And he did it the same way he did most everything else in his professional life. He stole it. <laughs> when I say stole, not quite stole. He, he poached the best players from his arch enemy's team. And when I say the best players, that's not quite accurate either. Oh, they were certainly the two best players on the Homestead Grays. Thing is, they also happen to be two of the best players who've ever played the sport of baseball. One of them was a promising young pitcher, a very lanky, thin guy named Satchel Page. The other was a slugging young catcher named of Josh Gibson. There is no overstating the importance of Josh Gibson and Satchel Page to breaking the color barrier because these two players alone, these two, Josh Gibson, Satchel Page, are the two players that white America looked at and said, oh my God, they're like two of the best players who've ever played baseball. That changed thinking overnight. It still would take another decade, but that, these two players would change. I always say they're the only two sung heroes because there's nothing unsung. <laughs> Satchel Page is one of the most colorful figures in American history, never mind baseball. Actually, one of the most quoted Americans, Satchel Page, bigger than life, bigger than life. Now, and by the way, both of these players are in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Satchel Page, bigger than life. Josh Gibson, very different. Very quiet, very shy, a life of tragedy. Uh, always said, I just let my bat do the talking, didn't want to talk. It was always a good day for Josh Gibson when he was playing on a team with Satchel Page, his friend, his sometimes roommate, teammate, because Satchel Page would draw all the media attention, and Josh Gibson didn't have to talk to anybody. But that bat did a lot of talking. Might have hit the longest home run ever hit Yankee Stadium, possibly 500 feet. Uh, he was known, even in his playing day, Josh Gibson was known as the Black Babe Ruth, right? So. My favorite story that I uncovered, speaking of this, so late in his playing days, Josh Gibson meets the real life Babe Ruth. They meet at some function in Washington and Babe Ruth throws his arm apparently around. I guess he liked to do this. I didn't know it until I, I thought I knew some things about Babe Ruth, but I guess he liked to throw his arm around somebody and shake him a little bit. You couldn't get away with that now. But he shook him a little bit and he said, Mr. Gibson, what a goddamn honor this is. He said, hey, I understand they call you the Black Babe Ruth. What do you think of that? And Josh Gibson looks up at Babe Ruth and he says, well, I, I got to tell you, Mr. Ruth, my people call you the White Josh Gibson. <laughs> so what do you think of that? So, so we've been talking about the Negro Leagues, okay, for the last almost 20 minutes. The biggest part of our talk, the Negro Leagues, which is as it should be, because as I said, they are the most important part of the whole story, right? But... How do we know so much about the Negro Leagues? I mean, there are whole libraries full. If, I, if, if, if you turn me loose in here for 20 minutes, I could find a dozen books about early black baseball in the Negro Leagues. Um, they were, people were following this team and yet nothing was recorded by the Negro Leagues. The Negro Leagues didn't keep track of their own records. So, I mean, these were hand-to-mouth operations. 
the Negro League, every Negro League team, and by every Negro League team, I mean pretty much through the 1940s into the 1950s. So I don't just mean during the Great Depression, were hand-to-mouth operations. It was all they could do to make sure that they had a bus. They had to be able to afford gas for the bus and hope the bus didn't break down. They had to bat some balls, uniforms, cleats, right? They didn't have statisticians. You go to Midtown Manhattan today, and the offices of Major League Baseball, 11, 12, 13th floor, three floors, statistics, stats. You can look up, you can Google the very first Major League game in history and see who did what in the bottom of the third inning. Not the Negro Leagues. They weren't keeping track of their stats, couldn't afford to. So you say, well, okay, well, what about the, the press? What about the media? Well, in the entire history of the Negro Leagues, 1920, they start to die out with the advent of the color barrier falling in 1947. Through the 1950s, more and more of them are disappearing. By the late 1960s, 1970, they're gone, right? In that entire history, there was not one white mainstream newspaper from coast to coast who ever, in that entire period, dedicated a single beat reporter to covering not a single Negro League team, not the entire Negro League themselves. The only time, the only time a white mainstream newspaper covered the Negro Leagues was when they were playing a white major league team. If the Red Sox were playing a Negro League team, which I don't believe they ever did, but if they did, then the Globe would have covered it. The Globe would have covered it, but not otherwise. Not otherwise. So if the Negro Leagues weren't keeping track of their own records, and the white mainstream press wasn't covering the Negro Leagues, how would we possibly know all that we know about the Negro Leagues? The second most important, vital, unsung hero in the entire story, second only to the Negro Leagues themselves, the black press. This is the golden age of the black press. There aren't as many black newspapers today. Most of those that still exist are not print but are online. And that's a good thing because that's one of the single things that represents progress that starts at this point in the story because at that time, in the 1930s, if you lived in a black community somewhere in America and you were concerned about an issue that was concerned to you and your community, you weren't going to look in the white mainstream press because they weren't covering your stories. That's what the black press did. And they covered the Negro Leagues because they were led by pioneering publishers like Robert Lee Van, publisher and founder of the Pittsburgh Courier, greatest, black distribu greatest distribution of any black newspaper in American history, just slightly more so than Robert Sengstack Abbott's equally legendary Chicago Defender. They hired pioneering sports writers like Wendell Smith and Sam Lacey, and these sports writers had a charge directly from their publishers, which today, as journalists, we would consider unseemly, if not downright unethical. Because today, we often speak in terms of a firewall that exists between the editorial side of things and the repertorial side of things. But these sports writers, even as they were out reporting on the Negro Leagues, had one single charge from those publishers. And that was to make sure that your readers know about the color barrier. Because you've got to understand, but color barrier falls in 1887. By the time you get to the 1920s, never mind the 1930s and later, people had begun to forget about it. You'd go to a major league ball game, you'd go to Fenway Park, you'd go to Yankee Stadium, you'd go to Briggs, wherever, Crosley Field, Forbes. You, you just, you're not thinking about it. This is what a major league team looks like. It's white. I mean, it would have been shocking if there had been a black ball player, right? So people had forgotten. The publishers understood that. And they never understood more so, with Robert Lee Van in particular, in 1939. When Satchel Paige pitched a very famous game for the Black Yankees against the New York Yankees at Yankee Stadium, and he struck out the great Joe DiMaggio three times. Only time in DiMaggio's entire career he struck out three times. And Robert Lee Van immediately, with the conclusion of that game, understood something, and he called Wendell Smith, because he understood that fans all over New York will be saying, that night, the next day, how do we get Satchel Page? Ah, you want Satchel Page? And Wendell Smith made sure people understood 
why you can't get Satchel Paige. Even though Robert Lee Van made clear and told Wendell Smith to make clear that he's prepared to produce Satchel Paige at noon the next day to sign a contract with the New York Yankees. So that story that Wendell Smith wrote about that game was being read by readers here in Quincy, all through the South Shore, in Boston, Bangor, Portland, Biloxi, Miami, Phoenix, Fort Worth, San Francisco, Duluth, you get the idea, all over the country. How? These newspapers, right, just like the Negro League teams they covered were also hand-to-mouth operations, concerned with whether they had what they need to get the paper out just five nights a week. And they don't have to get it out to the whole city because the whole city isn't reading a black newspaper. All they have to do is get the paper out to the six or seven little newsstands around just the black section, the Hill District of Pittsburgh. And still it was a challenge, five nights a week. So how are they doing? The Globe didn't have national distribution in the 1930s. How were they doing that? The second most improbable, in some ways, ally in the entire story, the Pullman Porters. You know, I, you know, I don't mean to paint myself as some sort of baseball authoritarian because I'm anything but, but I knew a little bit because I, you know, love baseball so much that I knew a little bit about some of the people we've been talking about. I didn't know anything about the Pullman Porters and their connection with the color barrier and how they helped. Because you might say logically, how would they help? The Pullman Porters are the face of overnight train travel in the Golden Age of Rail in the 20s, 30s, 40s. They are, they're servants on wheels. That's not my description. That's the mission statement of George Mortimer Pullman, who founded the Pullman Porters, that they would be servants on wheels. So what do they have to do with baseball? On the face of it, absolutely nothing. However, those pioneering publishers were very imaginative, creative two guys, Abbott and Van. And they looked at the Pullman Porters and they said, huh, these are black men who have a job to ride all around the country every day, every part of the country. You know, if we could somehow enlist some of them to help deliver our newspapers, we would not only grow our own distribution, but we would be able to remind people all over the country, not just in New York, not just Pittsburgh, about the color barrier still existing, and they succeeded. They didn't need all the Pullman Porters, and they never got most of them, never mind many of them. They only needed one or two making a run around the country, any one of whom would have been fired on the spot if they'd ever been caught delivering black newspapers, but not a single one ever was. Now you might wonder, how did, how did it work? How did it work? Well, the Pullman Porters, in addition to all their other jobs, provision the train, right? They work the kitchen. So let's say you have a train that's leaving South Station, Boston. Let's say it's gonna make a run down the Eastern Seaboard, all the way down through New York, Philly, Baltimore, Chattanooga, Miami. So they would have a deal, let's say, with the, uh, with the black bakery in Boston. Mattapan, Dorchester, Roxbury, little bakery truck would come down to South Station with the bread. At that time, you could roll right out on the platform. Little bakery truck, you know, had a little platform in the back, would have three or four, probably five foot tall wicker baskets with the bread. Underneath the bread, the black newspapers from Boston, the Boston Guardian, the Boston Reporter, the Boston Chronicle, true story. So they would take off, they would offload Boston's black newspapers when they hit Penn Station, right? They would surreptitiously onload the black newspaper of record at the time in New York, the Amsterdam News. They would do the same thing in Baltimore, same thing in DC, same thing in Chattanooga, all the way down to Miami. So that by 1939, they're hitting everywhere in the country. And you have another great anecdote that feeds off that game in 1939 when DiMaggio struck out three times because you have a visiting New York Times executive in LA. So he gets up the next morning after that game because his wife tells him, honey, you're not going to believe what happened at Yankee Stadium. He says, oh, first thing in the morning, I'll go out, I'll grab the Times. It should have come in overnight from Denver. So he gets up. I'm sure he put on his little jaunty fedora, fired up a 
unfiltered lucky strike and he's walking down Hollywood Boulevard. He stops at a newsstand. He's looking for the Times, can't find it. Sees the Pittsburgh Courier, a black newspaper, published two days earlier. Keeps walking. Can't find the New York Times. The Courier, the Chicago Defender. He calls New York. He says, um, what the hell is going on here? That was the Pullman Porters. So now we're up to 1940. Now, spoiler alert, big time, because now we have less than 10 minutes left in our talk and only five years, and the color barrier is going to fall. Spoiler alert. How? <laughs> 1940, Major League Baseball is no closer. Major League Baseball won't even talk about the color barrier in 1940, and yet it's going to fall in five years. How is that going to happen? It won't talk about it, because, mostly because of this guy. So... Talk about job security. So Kennesaw Mountain Landis was baseball's commissioner in 1940. Kennesaw Mountain Landis was also baseball's first commissioner in 1920. So he won't even talk about it. This is a guy who was routinely described as mule-headed, stubborn, ornery. And that was a word his wife used. So what happens? Well, for starters, may he rest in peace, Kennesaw... Mountain Landis dies in 1940, and he is replaced by a new commissioner, Happy Chandler, who is at least open to talking about the color barrier, but that's not what's going to bring it down. What brings it down is that things are shifting to New York because the second decade, right, after the Negro Leagues, the 30s also end with another worldwide cataclysm, which of course is what? World War II. Because in New York, this guy, Lester Rodney is about to frame the argument that'll bring the color barrier down. Lester Rodney is nobody's profile of a, uh, someone fighting to bring down the color barrier. First of all, New York wasn't the focus of the struggle to begin with. It was more Pittsburgh, Washington, Chicago. Now it's New York, so that's unlikely. And he just does not look the part. He's, uh, he's in New York. He's white. He's Jewish. He's a communist. Hey, nobody's perfect, okay? But he's also a sports writer. He would have written for anybody. But in the late 1930s, the American Communist Party's daily newspaper, the Daily Forward, started a sports section. And he got the job. And he got the job. And he loves baseball, hates the color barrier. And he's also willing to stick his neck out and make a prediction that a lot of people didn't want to hear at the time that America will go to war. America will be going to war. Um, he was pilloried by a lot of people, some big people. Didn't like that he was pushing this. Some big people with big names like, oh, uh, Lindbergh. Um, didn't like the fact that he was saying to New York, uh, you mark my words, we will be going to war. But furthermore, he pointed out that blacks as well as whites will be training to fight and will be asked to die if necessary to defend democracy. And those who are black and return from having been asked to die for their country will return to a country where they're still second class citizens, still unable to sit where they want on a bus and still unable to play Major League Baseball. If you've ever wondered, this is the argument that turned the color barrier. This is the argument that changed America's mind. Look, the color barrier was as wrong and obscene during the First World War as it was with the advent of the Second World War. But this is the time now that it becomes too much, a bridge too far. It happens. You know, in terms of our present day, it happens. It happens sometimes that a huge social issue just begins to wilt under the fact that it can't really be morally defended, right? It happened, I would say, in my own personal opinion, it happened with marriage equality, right? It just begins to sag by the fact that it's too difficult to defend against people loving who they choose. And that's what happens with the color barrier. So he makes that argument. That argument is picked up by others. It's picked up by the Pittsburgh Courier, the Pittsburgh Courier, because, mind you, that was an agonizing choice. You read some of the, 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 the letters and the writings of young black men and women who were deciding whether or not they did want to go and die for a country 
that wouldn't let them sit where they want on a bus, that wouldn't let them play Major League Baseball. And so the Pittsburgh Courier started a double victory campaign, double V. And that was meant to help rationalize that decision for young black men and women. Yes, go fight. Defeat Adolf Hitler, victory one, come home, defeat Jim Crow. Victory too. And that handkerchief was given out for free with their newspapers at a certain time. It was worn in the bomber jacket sleeves of all members of the Tuskegee Airmen, the most celebrated all-black unit in World War II. But it's another all-black unit that's going to take us to the end of the story right now from the turret of a tank. The 761st Tank Battalion, the original Black Panthers. 761st was America's first all-black armored unit. Um, and you might wonder what makes them part of this story, because the 761st was commanded by a young lieutenant named Jack Roosevelt Robinson. Jackie Robinson got his uh, lieutenant stripes at Fort Kansas in 1940. By 1941, he'd been transferred to Fort Hood in Texas to help take command of the 761st. And Jackie Robinson could not wait to climb into the turret of a Sherman tank and go to war against the Nazis. Didn't get there. The 761st did, without its young lieutenant. Just before the 761st shipped out, Jackie Robinson flunked his final physical. An old knee injury reared its head. He'd been an all-American halfback at UCLA, not cleared for combat. Desperately asked for permission, went all the way to the White House, asked for special permission to accompany the unit as a morale officer, special morale officer, request denied. Robinson said it was the biggest disappointment of his life. Unit ships out, Jackie Robinson decides he's gonna leave the hospital, he's gonna go back to the base, get a drink at the black officers club, you know, drown his sorrows, uh, jumps on a bus. Fort Hood's still one of the biggest military bases in the world, buses constantly circling the base. He jumps on a bus, takes a seat right behind the driver, front row. You can guess where this is going. So at that time, as you obviously, you, you clued in, right? So at that time, it didn't matter whether it was a bus in, uh, you know, Skokie, Illinois, or, or Chattanooga, or on a base, on a military base, where, by the way, the, 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 the black serviceman or woman uh, sitting in that front row might be somebody missing a limb, convalescing at the base, coming back from combat, and yet, they would still be expected to move to the back of the bus as it began to fill up with white passengers, which it did. Now, Jackie Robinson knew something that night that the driver didn't know, may not have known, testified later he didn't know, doesn't matter. But Jackie Robinson knew that 48 hours earlier, President Roosevelt had signed an executive order forbidding segregation on transportation in domestic American military bases. So he knew he's on the base, he can sit where he wants on the bus. Driver either didn't know, didn't care, again, doesn't matter. Bus filled up, Jackie Robinson refused to move. Bus driver pulled over to a sentry post, two MPs got on the bus, they arrested Jackie Robinson, handcuffed him, court-martialed, insubordination. <coughs> How many of you know that Jackie Robinson was once court-martialed? Right. You know, it's interesting, you know, it's interesting because I always say it sounds like tortured logic, but if you knew that Jackie Robinson was court-martialed and you brought up, did you know Jackie Robinson was once court-martialed, the only answer anybody could give you would be, who the hell is Jackie Robinson? Because if Jackie Robinson had been court-martialed and dishonorably discharged, we would never know his name. Branch Rickey would never have been able to sign him, but he beat the court-martial. Now, in 1945, he's honorably discharged, and he needs a job. So he's about to trade his army uniform for a baseball uniform because some folks have told him, if you want a job, Jackie, you should get in touch with the president of the Kansas City Monarchs, J.L. Wilkinson, and, uh, and ask him if you can uh, try out for the, the Monarchs for the 1945 season. So he did. He wrote him a letter. He wrote J.L. Wilkinson a letter, and he asked him, could he have a tryout? with the Kansas City Monarchs. And J.L. Wilkinson didn't write back. He picked up the phone and called him. I would have loved to have been on this phone call. It's, it's actually a lot of fun to read Jackie Robinson's uh, recollection of the call in his autobiography. But, uh, so he answers the phone and he says, um, hi, this is Jackie Robinson. And J.L. Wilkinson says, I know who the hell you are, I called you. <laughs> so there's a long pause, the first of many. And he says, uh, 
I understand you'd like a tryout with my monarchs, is that right? And Robbins said, yes, sir, if I could. And he says, uh, no, you can't have a tryout. Now, Robbins said it felt like the line went dead for five minutes. It probably was less, but at some point, Wilkinson comes back and he says, would you like to know why you can't have a tryout, Mr. Robinson? And he says, yes, sir. And he says, because I'm offering you a job. Now get yourself to Houston. We're halfway done with spring training. And he hung up the phone. So Robinson gets himself to Houston to start spring training with the Kansas City Monarchs. Now, nobody knew that Jackie Robinson had once been court-martialed. How many of you know that less than three weeks from the time this photo was snapped of Robinson taking the field on opening day in Kansas City, April 1945, that Robinson would not be in Kansas City that day. He'd be less than 45 minutes from right here, right now, on the field at Fenway Park, trying out for the Boston Red Sox. Because at the same time that Jackie Robinson is starting camp with the Monarchs in Boston, this man is desperately trying to arrange a tryout for Jackie Robinson. Now, he doesn't know Jackie Robinson, He's trying to arrange a tryout for some black ball players. Because Izzy Muchnick, who is, I go into much greater detail in the book, a very fascinating figure, uh, tragically, really, in some ways. Um, he is somebody who is constantly, the, 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 I, I always think the, the, the name that comes to mind, my mind in terms of literature is Don Quixote. Because Izzy Muchnick was always tilting at windmills. He was the second Jewish Boston City Councilor. He would become the first chairman of the Boston School Committee. And his colleagues in politics were always telling him, Izzy, would you leave it alone, right? I mean, he wanted to force the Red Sox to have a tryout for black ball players. He did get a bill finally passed that did, this is talk about ahead of his time, that got pay parity for women working in Boston schools. So he was always trying to find some cause bigger than him. And he was quite influenced by Lester Rodney's argument about bringing the color barrier down. He said, oh, look, I'm not a sports writer, but what can I do? He was a brilliant young lawyer, Harvard, Harvard Law School, could have worked for any of those, you know, what they used to call the white shoe Boston law firms, but he refused to change his name. So he became a little too ethnic for Palmer and Dodge. So he, he, realizes that if he could find some leverage, right? I mean, he's a lawyer. He knows it's not enough to ask the Red Sox nicely if they'll have a tryout for black ball players. So he's desperately trying to find, you know, is there some leverage? Is there some ordinance or bylaw that I'm not aware of? And then he finds it. And he finds it in those old crusty blue laws that used to exist, right? And there was, there was a blue law on the books in 1945 that prohibited professional baseball being played in Boston on a Sunday without the unanimous vote of the Boston City Council. And easy much, like I've always imagined him late at night pouring through this and taking his glasses off and realizing, uh, I'm on the City Council. <laughs> All I have to do is threaten to withhold my vote and I got leverage. So he wrote a letter to the Boston Brain, Brain Trust of the Red Sox. There they are, there's Yawkey, there's player manager Joe Cronin, there's general manager Eddie Collins, who he wrote to himself, a former Hall of Famer. And he said, Mr. Collins, I'm writing to ask you if you would consider, in light of the many qualified Negro, as he wrote, ball players returning from war, if the Red Sox would consider holding a tryout, not offering a job, just a tryout to some of these players. And Eddie Collins writes back and he says, my esteemed co colleague, and counselor Muchnick. He said, I must tell you, while I certainly sympathize with your sincere request, it may interest you to know that in my entire tenure with the Boston Red Sox, not a single black ball player has ever inquired about employment. We can only deduce there's no interest. Cordially yours, Eddie Collins. So Izzy Muchnick is a bulldog, okay? Played goal for Harvard hockey, no mask. I mean, he knows when he's taken a load of incoming, you know what. So he waits a little, he waits a little more, and he waits until it's exactly one week to the day before that vote on Sunday baseball in the Boston City Council. And he sends a cablegram to Eddie Collins this time, quicker. And he says, Mr. Collins, it appears you have no interest. 
in honoring my humble request and therefore this cable should serve to inform you that when the vote on Sunday baseball is held in the city council chamber of Wednesday, Wednesday next, I will be withholding my vote. Now, obviously I don't know what the exact duration of time was between Eddie Collins reading that cable and appearing in his boss Tom Yawkey's office. I have a very strong sense it was well under five minutes and he was running because that would have been a cataclysm for the Red Sox financially in 1945. 1945, pre-TV, baseball was about 100% revenue from ticket sales and on Sundays in 1945, every single Major League team plays two games, a doubleheader, every Sunday. Red Sox would have been denied 50% of their Sunday revenue, unthinkable. They send a cable back, fine. It's actually exactly what they said, fine. You can have your tryout. No press, any press, the deal's off. Three players, that's it, three. Have them at Gate D, Fenway Park, 11 a.m., Monday, April 12th. Cordially yours. Now, Izzy Muchnick knew a lot about Boston's bylaws, he didn't know a lot about black baseball. So he consulted with our friend Wendell Smith of the Pittsburgh Courier, and he asked him if he would personally select three qualified black ball players, and he did, including a promising young infielder out of Kansas City named Jackie Robinson. And they trooped to Boston, all set to try out. Tryout didn't happen, because on April 12th, 1945, history intervened. President Roosevelt died. And America shut down. 24 hours later, America began to open back up. 48 hours later, America was pretty much back to normal, except at the offices of the Boston Red Sox, where, I mean, they appeared from the outside to be in the midst of inconsolable grief. No, they were trying to run out the clock, and they almost made it. They almost made it one more day. April 16th, that's all they have to get to because on the afternoon of April 16th, the Sox will catch a train to New York where they're going to open up the season against the Yankees at the stadium on the 17th. But on the morning of April 16th, a white sports writer, the old record American, Dave Egan, breaks the story. Front page. He does it as kind of a, uh, a letter to Boston sports fans. Really, it was front page, so it was the, all the readers and he said, you are not aware, dear reader, but at this hour, there are three qualified and competent Negro, as he wrote, ball players who have been marooned in a Boston hotel room for a week, having been promised a tryout by a Boston Red Sox, who are now trying to renege on their promise and skip town. Well, the Red Sox knew they'd been had. They had to have the tryout. They called up Izzy Muchnick. They told him to get the players over there. They did. They trooped over to Fenway Park. They took the field. They suited up. They took the field. They ran the bases. They took some batting practice. Less than 45 minutes later, they were called off the field. Uh, Joe Cronin thanked them all very much. He shook their hands, shook their hands and told them the Red Sox will be in touch. Not, not, not a single one of them ever heard from the Red Sox for the rest of their natural lives. But you know who was paying rapt attention that morning? About 200 miles to the south, Branch Rickey. And Branch Rickey is getting reports that morning that apparently nearly gave him a stroke. Um, that at that very hour, he was told, while he was drinking his coffee, Tom Yawkey, who he loathed, by the way, in Boston, is trying out three black ball players, including Jackie Robinson, with whom they already had a plan to sign him that very year to break the color barrier. So he was going crazy. Um, in hindsight, look, we know that if we could have jumped in a time machine and gone back, we could have calmed them down. We could have said, you know, Branch, easy, have another cup of coffee. Seriously, it's going to take Tom Yawkey 14 more years to break the car. I think you can relax. He didn't know. He didn't know. So as soon as the Negro League season ended in September 1945, Jackie Robinson right there was whisked to Montague Street in the executive offices of the Brooklyn Dodgers in Brooklyn Heights, where he signed a contract for the Dodgers' top minor league team in Montreal, the Montreal Royals. And then two years later, almost to the day of that sham tryout, wearing number 42, as he strode out to his position at first base, amid the din of cheering fans, of broadcasters announcing history, and of exploding flashbulbs capturing it, I submit there were also two inaudible sounds at Ebbets Field that day the sound of a wall falling, 
and of a cheering that could not be heard with the ear, only with the heart. It rose from those not present physically, but spiritually. Those who could not be seen, but were there just the same. Moses Fleetwood Walker didn't live to see it. And by the time he died, broken, bitter, alcoholic, he couldn't even imagine it. But he was there. Bud Fowler, right? Bud Fowler, who had traveled the entire Western Hemisphere just to play baseball, appearing everywhere, from the Klondike to you name it. This day, he was in Brooklyn. The Pullman Porters, some of whom that very day were crossing the country and riding the rails and starting out and literally driving less than a mile on a train from Ebbets Field. They were there. The Negro Leaguers, past and present. Those who were too old and those who were young enough to imagine on this day that they too might walk through the wall. And the African American veterans of the war just ended. And those who indeed gave their lives in it. They were there. On this momentous day, a ball game was played before a crowd both present and cheering, and another crowd silent and unseen. They watched the game, and they watched the terrible wrong being finally righted. To be sure, even as a black ball player bounded onto an otherwise all-white field, racism was still alive and well in Brooklyn and clear on across America. So many other barriers remained in place. Sadly, many still are. But on this day, hope and faith that had long seemed to have run out seemed to be finally salved. On this day, the dreams that had existed and been dashed for decades seemed to be finally redeemed. On this day, the long arc of the moral universe seemed to bend improbably toward Brooklyn, touching down on the dirt and the grass of a creaky old ballpark where the familiar white lines would no longer bar a black ball player. And in the bottom of the seventh inning, right there, when Jackie Robinson came to bat and laid down a perfect bunt and raced toward first base, he was not alone. That invisible crowd was right there, running right alongside, willing him on. And when Robinson sprinted safely onto second base and caught his breath, they exhaled with him. After all, it had been a long, uncertain 60-year journey, and they helped him get there. The next Dodger batter doubled. Jackie Robinson rounded third, and he was home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you were getting your homework done, young lady. Um, <laughs> but thank you for joining us at whatever point. You get extra credit then, and there'll be no quiz. Uh, if anybody has a question, uh, happy to answer any... How, how did your interest in this subject get sparked? How did my interest get sparked? So, as I said, I mean, I've always loved baseball. Jackie Robinson has been a lifelong hero of mine. In fact, when I was 13 years old, my dad gave me a framed photograph of Jackie Robinson uh, on that day that he debuted at Ebbets Field. Uh, and the <laughs> funny thing about... Uh, a few months later, he gave me a penny that he'd found in his change that was a 1947 penny, which was the year, right? So I taped it on there. It's still taped on there. I've often thought I should approach like Scotch tape, because it'd be a great commercial for like, it's the original tape. Um, so I was a huge fan of Jackie Robinson. But as, as, as I got older, um, and I started to read more about baseball history, I was always fascinated by these names I heard mentioned, um, who I didn't know, and was seemed to be part of that story. And you know when it really, that really began to be amplified was with, um, you know, with the advent of the internet, right? So like every single time a new book would come out about Jackie Robinson, or a movie, like 42 is a great example, because that's the first time I learned about Wendell Smith and Sam Lacey, those journalists, um, and some amazing women journalists who were part of that story as well. And, I would say, and, and I'd go online, and there would always be somebody in the comments section going, great, another new movie of Jackie Robinson, and no mention once again of Sam Lacey. I'm like, who is this guy, right? That's what did it. So I started reading about it, you know, and he was like, wow, he really did help pave the way. That's what it was. I just thought, you know, the, 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 it's, these people are really deserving 
of, uh, you know, whatever minor, small, little attention. But um, they really help pave the way, you know? And that's true of so many great achievements, you know? There's people, you know, there's people who help pave the way all the time. But often we just know, you know, the famous person, you know? To take nothing away, you know? Yeah, absolutely, it takes nothing away from Jackie Robinson. But, uh, you know, you often have to, you know, stand, uh, stand on the shoulders of people who are willing to, to get out there first. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes? What would it take for a woman to break the gender barrier? Today in baseball? Today. Hmm. That's a good question. I think they're going to have to nibble around the edges first. I think, and that's happening, right? So you, ha you now have three uh, women who have served the general managers. Um, in, of major league teams, that would have been unthinkable 15, 20 years ago, unthinkable. Um, you have a number of, uh, of conditioning coaches uh, now that are women in major league baseball, major league, not, not minor league, major league. Um, <sighs> will you get a woman manager before a player? That's my thinking because there have been major league managers, men, who didn't play. Uh, there have been certainly major league managers who didn't play major league baseball, uh, came up through the minors. I think that it's possible. I think that it's possible. I think that um, there'll have to be probably some other positions that are picked off first. There has yet to be a major league um, umpire woman. Uh, they are umpiring in the minors and all through college baseball. But uh, there has yet to be a, a, a woman as a major league umpire. I have a feeling those will have to come first. Could a woman play major league baseball? I, I, I would never say never. I think it'd be great. But I think it's still going to be a while. I think it's still going to be a while. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, so, did yeah. You play baseball yourself? Did I play baseball? I did. Uh, no, I did. I did. I played up through high school. Um, uh, my problem was all I could do was uh, throw the ball really uh, hard, so that, that worked for a while, you know, um, but even, in, even by the time I got to high school, I was, you know, like I would be pitching relief if I got in because, you know, I just, I could never, I could never make, throw a, a breaking ball, you know, I could never make the ball do anything, so by that point, if you can't do that, you're finished. So, but it was fun while it lasted. I did coach both of my daughter's softball teams, and that was actually even more fun although more frustrating. Um, <laughs> so listen, thank you all very much for coming out. I really appreciate it. If, uh, if anybody would like uh, a book, I'd be happy to, uh, to sign one for you. Um, and otherwise, uh, I hope I'll see you next time through. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>